does scripture allow for women eldership? This seems to be the direction of some churches today. Absolutely and unequivocally not. I mean, look, this, how can a woman be an elder when an elder has to be a one-woman man? What is that? This doesn't make any sense. How can a woman be an elder when it says in 1 Timothy 2 that I permit not a woman to teach or to take authority over men? There is no way. What you have to do is reject the Scripture, convolute the Scripture, reinvent the Scripture, twist the Scripture. Um, Look at 1 Timothy 2. It might be worth just a glance at that because it's kind of the key text and... uh, but this, the thing that concerns me, and the reason I'm real strong in that, is because it's an attack on Scripture. You, you want to know something quite interesting? The 20th century is the first century when the traditional conviction of the church on this issue has been overturned. In fact, 1960 was the first time that this began to be attacked. That's a pretty good legacy of consistent interpretation of a very clear text. Um, Let a woman, verse 11, receive instruction with entire submissiveness. And by the way, this is about the church, chapter 3, verse 15, how to conduct yourself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So this is about life in the church. One, Let a woman receive instruction with entire submission. I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. This is not cultural. This is creation. It was Adam first created, then Eve. It was not Adam deceived. The woman being deceived fell into transgression. It was the divine creative order and the demonstration of the fact that when the woman got out from under the authority of the man and acted independently, she was deceived. Um, That is the, the affirmed biblical pattern. And just to support that, there's no woman in the Old Testament that had an ongoing prophetic ministry. There are a couple of occasions where God used a woman to speak, uh, but there is no woman in the Old Testament with an ongoing prophetic ministry, none. There is no woman who wrote a book of the Bible, either the Old Testament or the New Testament. There is no woman among the apostles. There is no New Testament woman with a prophetic ministry, although the four daughters of Philip did speak there, there's no basis for thinking anything other than that God has upheld this in His design all the way through. Uh, it is not to say that women are inferior. They are not. They are equal in Christ. They are equal spiritually. They are equal in value, uh, equal before God. It is just a matter of the roles that God has designed for them to play. But verse 15 is the balancing element. Verse 15 says, women are preserved or saved from what? From some stigma, some second-class consideration through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Look, men have leadership in the church. You say, well, how, uh, isn't there a significant role for women? Sure, it's, a, it's the balance of women bearing children. Uh, you know, we know this in the family. I mean, I'm, I'm the head of the house, and, you know, I, I have ultimate responsibility, although I, I want to submit to my, my wife as, as she submits to me. I want to meet her needs. Um, but at the, in the end of the day, I've given the headship of the family and the responsibility. As First Corinthians says, God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman. But women are protected from some second-class consideration through the bearing of children. You know, I'm the, I'm the head of the house, and I say what ought to be done. But Patricia is the one who has all the influence. And even my two sons, who are men, if they, if they want to unburden their heart, always go to their mother. There's a level of influence that is really profound in in the intimacy of rearing children, provided the women continue in faith and love and virtue and self-restraint. A godly woman as a keeper at home, a lover of her husband, a lover of her children, Paul says, is going to have the greatest impact, not if she comes to lead the church, but if she uses her influence. I actually kind of have a little follow-up to that then as well. Uh, It says, since... In the Bible, it says a woman should go to her husband for spiritual questions. Do you think Bible studies are wise for women in church? 
Yeah, I think women, uh, I think a great host, the Bible says, are women that publish the good news. I think women should come together uh, to, to pray. I think uh, there are informal settings where women can pray, where they can be engaged in Bible studies. I don't have a problem with women having Bible studies. How could I? There are women who are gifted teachers. There are women who know the truth. And there's nothing in the Bible that says a woman doesn't, uh, can't teach. Uh, she can teach other women. She can teach children. Uh, you remember Aquila and Priscilla, b both of them uh, instructed Apollos more perfectly in a way in a private home setting. So uh, this is not to say anything about giftedness. I think women can express leadership. They can engage in Bible study. They can teach women and teach children. But what they cannot do is take the pastoral place or the role of the teacher and the preacher in the church as duly assembled. She just wanted to know why, why women are not allowed to to preach in the church, um, and if, if a woman feels that she has the gift of preaching, why, why isn't she allowed um, to preach? Thanks. All right. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. So, because the Bible says so. Um, and that's it. The other thing is, well, what if a person feels like they have gifts to do that? Uh, no one gets to do everything they feel like they're gifted at. No one does. Um, what if a man who has several wives feels like he's gifted to be a pastor? The Bible says he must be the husband of one wife, right? So just because you feel like you're gifted to do something, that doesn't give you the right to overthrow biblical qualifications. Um, the office of the elder. Uh, Paul says, you know, when he's talking about the elder, he must be the husband of one wife. He's talking about a man, okay? That office is exclusively for men. Um, that's the office of the pastor teacher. Um, so if the office is exclusively for men, and the Bible is very clear that women are not to teach or exercise authority over men, there's absolutely no room um, for women to be in that office or to exercise that authority in the church. Uh, does 1 Timothy 2.12 leave open the possibility that women are permitted to preach in the weekly gathering of a local church as an extension of the male elders of the church or as an expression under their governing authority? For example, is the wife of a pastor free to preach on Sunday morning? What would you say, Pastor John? Well, I don't want to assume that any of our listeners have all the biblical foundations in place for doing this kind of refined uh, application thinking. So let me let me put a few things in place, and then I'll specifically answer the question. Here's the text that we're talking about, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 14. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So let me work backward in that text toward my answer to the question. And, and I would remind uh, the listeners that every, every one of these comments raises more questions. <laughs> So there is a book, little little book called 50 Crucial Questions About Manhood and Womanhood that Wayne Gudeman and I did, and it's free online at Desire and God PDF. And uh, if you have more questions, I hope they're answered there. At least some of them will be, I hope. So Paul gives two reasons, uh, and they're not the only ones, for why he would limit uh, the teaching and governing office of the church to spiritually qualified men. Reason number one, verse 13, Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is shorthand for about eight to ten pointers in Genesis 1 to 3 that God intended the man to bear a unique responsibility, not sole responsibility, but unique and special responsibility for leadership in relation to women. That man was created first is one of those eight to ten pointers, and in a sense symbolizes all the others. You are there first, 
You bear first responsibility to lead, protect, especially when it comes to attacks from outside, which was just about to happen in chapter 3 as Satan approaches the couple who will take up responsibility to be the protector and the spokesman here and give leadership in the face of this kind of opposition. So that's number one. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Second argument he gives is um, based on that order being ignored, namely when Satan comes and it appears that both Adam and Eve are present. That's pretty plain uh, in the text in chapter 3, verse 6 of Genesis. Adam and Eve ignored that order, and Paul says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. What does that mean? There's a sense in which Adam was deceived. He did eat. In fact, when Paul treats the fall of man in Romans 5, he lays the guilt entirely on Adam, never even mentioning Eve as the guilty party here. So my understanding is not that Paul is drawing attention to a woman's greater gullibility, although in reality... I would say men are more gullible in some things and women are more gullible in some things. Lots of studies have been done on the kinds of advertising that draw men in and the kind that draw women in. And we are all differently gullible. And so I don't want to be naive and say we're exactly the same in our gullibility, but I'm not sure that's the focus of Paul here. The the main point is the reason she was deceived is that the deceiver lured her and Adam to switch places that God had appointed. It's as if the general and the colonel, the man and the woman, the general and the colonel rode up to the enemy together And the enemy utterly ignored the general, spoke directly to the colonel, and they both, the general and the colonel, let it happen. So Genesis 3, 6 says that the man was with Eve while the enemy was talking to her. Quote, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So Satan's first assault was on the order that God had appointed. And both Adam and Eve, at that moment, were duped. They let it happen. And when Paul says, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, he's saying Satan undermined the order of creation and focused his deceptive words on Eve and made her the spokesman, not Adam, and she became the focus of the deception, not Adam. Adam failed in his leadership, and she was willing to take it up. And the result was the fall and all of its consequences. So from those two arguments in this text, Paul draws the conclusion in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. In other words, there's an order of how men and women are to relate to each other. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And those two words, teach and have authority, are the very two differences between a deacon and an elder in the local church, as Paul describes them in the list of responsibilities in chapter 3. Elders are to govern well, and they are to be apt to teach. The deacons aren't supposed to be either of those, and therefore I take verse 12 to mean I don't permit a woman to assume the role of an elder in the church, to act the role of an elder. Whether you call them elders doesn't matter. It's the acting of the role of the elder in the church since they are the ones charged with the responsibility of authoritative teaching. And of course, not all not all teaching is inappropriate for women. She Titus two three she is to teach the younger women, for example. But the kind of teaching uh, that belongs to the eldership, namely the teaching that carries authority over men, is what Paul thinks would compromise God's order, and that's the issue, not competency. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking, oh, a, a woman is not permitted 
to do this kind of authoritative teaching because she's incompetent. That's not the issue. The issue is that it would compromise the way men and women are supposed to relate to each other. So my answer to the question is, okay, all that to put in place. The question, here's the, here, here's the question. Let me remind the, the listener. Does 1 Timothy 2.12 leave open the possibility that women are permitted to preach in the weekly gathering of the local church as an extension or under the governing authority of the male elders of the church? And my answer is no. Neither of those qualifications, that is, an extension of or under the governing authority of, overrides the teaching of verse 12. Paul would say, a female is not a proper extension of male leadership. That doesn't make sense. That's a contradiction of male leadership, not an extension of male leadership. And a woman teaching men with authority week in, week out, or every other week, or regularly in an adult Sunday school class or whatever, a woman teaching men with authority uh, under the elders is not under the authority of the New Testament. She may be under the authority of the elders, but she's not under the authority of the New Testament, and neither would they be for putting her in that situation. So I would I would conclude, no, that is inappropriate for churches to do that. God loves his church. He loves men and women. He loves to see all of us flourish in the use of our gifts. No man or woman should sit on the sidelines of Christian ministry. Let that be plain. No woman, no man sits on the sidelines in Christian ministry. The question is not whether all men and women should be active in ministry. They should. The only question is how. Women pastors. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. Listen, biblically, biblically, the highest position in the church of Jesus Christ after the apostles and prophets would be the office of bishop right? What we call episkopos. Nowhere in the New Testament you find that office assigned to women. It's men. So when they say, well, it's cultural. No, it's biblical. It's not cultural. And it makes sense because the bishop represents who to the church? The bishop is standing in the role and the place and behalf of who? Jesus. Yes. Now, Jesus is what to the church? The wife of the church or the husband of the church? He's the, the husband. The so how can you have right? a woman representing the husband? Yeah, you're right. So no woman pastors. However, biblically and historically, they were female deacons. This is a, in the Bible as well as in church history. Females were allowed to be deacons serving under the authority of male leadership, male bishops. This is a fact. So you can have females as deacons. You can even have females being sent out with men to preach the gospel, like Priscilla and Aquila, right? You can have females who are inspired by the Spirit to prophesy. Let me show you that. Since you brought it up and you're a sinner, I want you to go to Acts 21, 8 to 9. Because, you know, you are a sinner, right? Uh, yep, Phoebe the deaconess in, in 1 Timothy three eleven, James. Okay. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. So they did what? Prophesied. So he had four prophesied. virgin daughters who were prophetesses inspired by the Spirit to prophesy, right? Yeah. You saw that? Acts 21, 8 to 9? Yeah. Now go to Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. Okay. Acts chapter 2, I want you to read 16 to 21. On the contrary, this is what was spoken to the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity. Then your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So wait, wait. Who will prophesy? Only your sons or your daughters? No, your sons and daughters. So even women will prophesy and be prophetesses in the church of Jesus Christ? Yeah. Okay, keep going. I'll even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves. So even slaves. female servants of God will be filled with the Holy Spirit to, debate, uh, to prophesy, right? Yeah. 
Go keep going. Yep, that's Joel, chapter Ooh. 2, verse 28 to 32. But keep going, read. And they will prophesy, I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire, and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon to blood before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Okay, so you caught it? Yeah. So did you catch that the Bible says women can be prophetesses, right? Yeah. And they prophesy because they too are filled with the Holy Spirit. So it shows you the Holy Spirit doesn't neglect and ignore women because he loves men more than women. The Holy Spirit loves all the members of the body of Christ equally. There are neither males nor females. You're all one in Christ. So the same Holy Spirit that gives men gifts, gives, the Holy, gives women gifts. The Holy Spirit can inspire a woman to be a prophetess. I'm talking about that time. As I said, today we don't have those kind of apostles and prophets. And the Holy Spirit does give gifts to women who are born of the Spirit, united to Christ, one with Him, part of His spiritual body. Till this day, they too receive gifts that they too must use to build one another up for the glory of Jesus Christ. But one office that women cannot assume because it's not assigned to them is the office of bishop. That's why these people say women can be pastors. They can't give you a single verse in the entire New Testament where a woman is assigned the role of bishop. Even though you can find women who are deacons, women who are prophetesses, women who went with men and preached the gospel, who were prominent among the apostles, who <clears throat> went around with apostles, sent out with apostles. In that sense, they too are apostles preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like Romans 16, 7. Read that for me. And Jonicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen and fellow prisoners, they are not, noteworthy in the eyes of the apostles. See, you're, that's not apostles. what it says. Allah Akbar! <laughs> it says, read it again. It mentions Junia. Agreed. And Jonicus and Junia, my fellow countrymen. Yes. Andronikos and, Andronikos and Junia. Junia. There is early attestation. Junia is a name of a woman. Greet them and do what? It says, greet them, my countrymen and fellow prisoners. They are, no, they are noteworthy in the eyes of no, the apostles. No, it doesn't say in the eyes of the apostles. The Greek says they are noteworthy, prominent among the apostles. Prominent among the apostles. So Junia, a name of a female, is a fellow prisoner with Paul, meaning that she went to prison for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So notice, guys. Even women went around preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even women went around glorifying Jesus Christ. And even women got persecuted, were thrown in prison, and killed for Jesus Christ. So that tells you that even women were empowered by the Spirit to go out with men and preach the gospel. And so what does he say about Junia? My fellow prisoner who is prominent among the apostles. You got it? Yeah. Now go so to Junia Romans. Woman, same Ro yeah, Junia, yeah. But go to now same chapter 16, verses 1 or 2. I commend you, our sister Phoebe, with a servant of the church. You know what the word servant is? I commend to you, I recommend you to take in Phoebe, who is coming to you. Servant, the word there is diakonos, who is a deaconess, a deacon. That's the word. Okay. So Phoebe, the deaconess, I commend her to you. Why? Because she's amazing. She's an amazing servant of Jesus, an amazing deaconess, that when she comes, greet her and support her. Read Romans 16, verses 1 to 2. Change your translation. The Old Christian Standard Bible is not as accurate. Okay. I commend you, the sister Phoebe, who is a servant. Who is a deaconess. Sankria, Sankria. So Thank you me. should welcome her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her. Did you catch in whatever it? Matter. Welcome her in a manner worthy of the saints because she's a holy servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, a woman who's prominent on fire for Jesus, filled the spirit, a deaconess who's worthy of your love and support and honor. <whistles> that tells you our Bible shows that women are not inferior. They are not the property of men. They are precious creatures created in the image of God 
who have equal value and worth as men do in the sight of Jesus, whom Jesus will use equally along with men to magnify his name because he loves them all because we're one in Christ. Okay? Yeah. Okay, did you get your answer, mine, or what, what's going on now? Talk to me. So it's just like in a church setting that they can't. No, they can't be bishops. Oh, yeah, they can't be pastors. And what about, like, say, like on a Sunday, they can't come and teach. The bishop all, right? is the one who has to determine that, meaning the bishop who is the head of the church in the place of Christ, he can say to a sister, sister, come up and read this verse. Sister, come up and share your story. Sister, come up. That's up to him, his discretion. Okay. But she can't lead the church as a bishop. 